Chemistry is one of the most maligned subjects in all of high school science. Many young biologists dread at the thought of taking the subject, which is really contrary to the thought of biology. In reality, chemistry explains what happens in biology. And today we're going to focus on the key aspect of chemistry, a very fundamental, very simple look at one of the most key points of chemistry, the atom. This is Big Orange Biology, I'm Mr. Jennings, and class is in session. So today we're going to talk about the atom. Now the atom is the smallest particle of matter that retains the element's unique properties. Now the atom is made of three components, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Now the proton and neutron are located in the nucleus, and we're not really going to focus on that today. Reason being is, for most purposes in chemistry, the proton and neutrons, at least for our level in biology, we talk about them radioactive data, so we're going to kick those things out. But we're going to talk about the electron. Now the electron is a negative particle found in the electron cloud. It is tiny, it is lightweight, and it is impossible to detect where its exact location is. That's why we call this electron cloud. All right, so we care about the valence electrons because they determine the atom's chemical reactivity. Now the number of valence electrons are gonna see how many chemical bonds are gonna form and how many electrons are potentially gonna be transferred. Now, we care about chemical reactivity because chemical reactions are really what we like to study a lot in chemistry and especially the biology side of chemistry. Now what happens during a chemical reaction is there is a chemical change. And that is because there has been a breaking and forming of the chemical bonds. Now there are two main types of chemical bonds, covalent and ionic. Now covalent and ionic bonds are relatively simple concepts. Uh, covalent is all about the sharing of electrons and ionic is all about the transfer of electrons. But they are fundamentally different in a lot of ways. So covalent compounds are probably the most complex and obviously the ones we like to spend with in biology. So the reason why covalent compounds are so complex is because sharing is never easy. Anybody who has siblings will understand that to be the truth. Now, a reason atoms don't share so easily inside of a molecule is because of the atom's electronegativity and the molecule's shape. Now, electronegativity is an atom's property that basically prevents it from sharing its electrons. It tends to favor holding on to electrons, even those of another atom. So when they're in the molecule, they tend to hold on to the electrons. And the shape matters because a molecule's shape is going to affect how the electrons are distributed. So atoms that have high electronegativity combined with a unique molecular shape are going to result in some really what we call polar molecules because they have a positive end on the bottom or wherever the electrons are no longer there and a highly negative end on the side that's favoring the electrons towards the electronegative molecule. Now, nonpolar compounds are covalent molecules that do share equally. Their electronegativity is about equal to each other. The bond shape is typically a linear shape. So there's no positive and negative ends. It's fairly balanced. So nonpolar compounds do exist, and they play a very vital role in biology and in chemistry. Nonpolar compounds, for instance, are typically like your oils and lipids out there that you see that you know oil and water don't mix that's because of their non-polarity now polarity matters in the grand scheme of things when it comes to cellular functions and cellular homeostasis abilities and we'll elaborate more on those in the future now ionic compounds are a lot more simple they are merely just a transfer of electrons one atom gives its electron away because it doesn't really need it. It needs one less valence electron, or two less valence electrons, or even three less valence electrons, because underneath that valence shell is a fully filled inner shell, and they want to get to where they are satisfied. They want to reach a grounded state. So they're willing to give away anything they can to reach that state. And meanwhile, there's usually another atom floating around that really wants another electron, because it needs one or two or maybe three more to become satisfied to reach their grounded state. So typically these are metals and nonmetals. Metals tend to give up electrons and nonmetals tend to pick up electrons. 
Now, atoms that give up electrons are called cations because they gain a positive overall charge because they end up having a little bit more proton than they do electrons, so a slightly positive charge. Negative atoms are the result of gaining these electrons, and we give negative atoms a special name of called an anion. Now, the reason these two form chemical bonds is because when you have a cation, which is positive, and an anion, which is negative, think of what happens whenever you have two ends of a magnet that are opposite of each other. They're going to pull towards each other. And that same thing happens whenever a cation and an anion are near one another. And that's what basically an ionic compound is. Now, we do deal with ionic compounds quite a bit in biology, but nowhere near to the extent of covalent compounds. Most of the macromolecules we talk about are covalent. Ionic compounds are relatively small, and their role is merely a nutritional role, though there are some involved in cell signaling and cellular processes, which we will elaborate more on in the future. Uh, now let's talk about the last type of bonds. So this is not really a true chemical bond. So when I said there's only two major chemical bonds we deal with in biology, I'm being mostly true. What we're going to talk about here is an intermolecular force known as hydrogen bonding. Now, the name hydrogen bonding doesn't mean it actually has to have hydrogen. It tends to help. But typically, it's formed between two polar covalent molecules, or a polar covalent molecule and an ionic compound. Hydrogen bonding can have an effect there, too. But true hydrogen bonding we typically see between two polar molecules. Now, the reason why is that because polar has a slightly negative end on top, usually on top, because that's how it's always drawn, and a slightly positive end on the bottom, usually how it's drawn. Not really there, it's a 3D image, so it could be anywhere on there. So because it has a slightly negative end and a slightly positive end, they are going to become kind of like the ionic compounds. They're going to be attracted to other from slightly negative and positives. So the slight negative end of one polar molecule will be attracted to the slightly positive end of the other polar molecule. Now, the reason why we call it hydrogen bonding is typically the positive end of all these polar molecules is hydrogen. And that's why we usually kill them. So, the one reason why we care about hydrogen bonding so much in AP biology and in any biology and chemistry for that matter is it comes down to this one specific phrase. A phrase I repeat so often in my classes that it is essentially the words of class Jennings. Now we're using the term words here much like a Game of Thrones reference, and if you don't know Game of Thrones, it's fine. Essentially, these are the phrases that every major house has. Every major family says these words because these words represent their beliefs and character traits. House Lannister is a Lannister always pays his debt. House Targaryen is fire and blood. And House Stark is winter is coming. Famous phrases, they're great to put on t-shirts, they're fantastic. And in House Jennings, our phrase is, our words are, structure determines function. Now, the reason why is the structure of an atom, the structure of its molecules, the structure of a cell, the structure of an organism, the structure of an ecosystem, the structure of a population, is all going to determine the function of every one of those rep representative things. Every single one of those, their structure, it matters so much. And the same holds true in molecules. So molecules that have intermolecular forces like hydrogen bonding, and we're talking about really large molecules, like proteins. And proteins are massive. They are tremendous size molecules. And in proteins, you can have all these hydrogen bonding forces happening within the same molecule, causing the molecule to fold and twist and creak and go all around each other, along with other intermolecular forces. And if you change the structure of that protein ever so slightly through like a mutation or through heat or a pH or any of that, you change its function. And that could be good or it could be very bad or it could be nothing at all. You could change its structure to the point where eh, it's still kind of functional. It may not be as great but not enough to be noticeable. But hydrogen bonding matters. Much like all these types of bonds. So today we kind of kept it on a simple level. We talked about the atom and gave a basic rundown of the electron and two types of chemical bonds along with hydrogen bonding. Each of these do play a very vital role in the biology curriculum. But they are not something you're going to see explicitly going, Hey, what is a covalent compound? That's not something that's going to be assessed. You do need to have an understanding, though, of what polarity is, what is nonpolarity, 
and ionic compounds. And today is mainly to serve as a primer of sorts. We will elaborate each, on each of these concepts down in future videos. But that wraps things up today. We're coming out of time. The bell's about to ring. This has been Big Orange Biology. I'm Mr. Jennings, and class is dismissed.